are so good. You are so good. Hallelujah. Just lift up your voice and give him praise right now. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. We give you glory, Father. We thank you. You are our shield. You are our rock. You are our defender. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your holy name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today for your presence with us. We thank you for this Father's Day as we celebrate fathers and men. Father, we also celebrate every day your goodness. We celebrate you. You teach us, Father, how to be fathers. You show us, Father, how much farther we need to go. And we thank you that you are the great example of the ultimate Father. Lord, reveal yourself to us this day as we study your word and teach us as children of God how we need to act in your family. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Welcome this morning. It is so good to have you with us on this Father's Day here at Abundant Life. And I want to give a shout out to all those that are uh, watching right now and uh, that are with us gathered in homes. We've started physically regathering and the plan the Lord gave us was to begin by people gathering in homes, in groups and experiencing the presence of the Lord together. I want to encourage you. This is not a, this is not just a small group or a home group. This is church at home. All right. And so the Holy Spirit's with you and he's going to be present with you. And when we're done today, I want to encourage you to pray for each other, minister to each other, enjoy a little bit of fellowship as you get ready to go and enjoy your Father's Day activities. Praise the Lord. This morning, uh, I want to minister to you something that has been in my spirit out of the things we've been teaching. And I want to revisit a story in the scripture. And uh, I believe it speaks prophetically to where we are right now. And the name of this message is simply Breaking Babel. Breaking Babel. And if you have your Bible, I want you to open it up to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Right now, we're living in a moment uh, in, in world history that we all know is unprecedented and is also uh, a great test. It's not only a test for those who live on, upon the earth in the world, tests of nations and tests of industries, uh, it's tests of families and marriages. It's tests of churches and spiritual communities as well. And when God tests us, it's not because he's trying to torment us. And when God allows us to go through a test, it's not because he doesn't love us. It's because part of his job as a father is not only to teach us, but then to allow us to experience tests so we can then apply what he's been teaching us or not. And very often, God, of course, God always knows what we know and what we don't know. We are very often, though, ignorant of what we're ignorant of. We don't see what we don't see and don't know what we don't know. And having raised uh, three sons and now uh, one grandson, and I can announce it, I have a second grandson on the way. He's in the oven right now, cooking good. Got three months left and my next, we don't have a name yet. I haven't heard a name from my daughter-in-law, Michelle, so we're just calling him Button. So Button is coming in three months, October 7th or thereabouts. I am so excited. I love being a grandparent. It's awesome. But I will tell you that, uh, that having been through being, uh, being a, a child and then being a parent and now being a grandparent and counseling lots of people over the years, that uh, we don't get things just because we have good intentions or just because we uh, are in the presence of information or even, you know, trying to apply it. The only way we really learn something is when we are tested. When what we've heard, we have an opportunity to apply. Now, tests aren't always fun. They're not always pleasurable, especially when they're 
pop quizzes or surprise tests. But if we have a different attitude towards a test and we realize God is not trying to stump us, nor when we fail a test or get a D on a test, is he looking for an opportunity to punish us? God's purpose in testing us is not to get information he doesn't know about us. You know, a teacher will test a student to see what they learned. God already knows what you've learned. The problem is not that God needs to figure out what you need to learn. You need to figure out. The test is for you. Because very often we think we got it down. I got it. I know, I, I, you know, I know how to tithe. I, I believe in, 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 in submitting to authority. I believe that you know, I, I'm hearing what God is saying about disciplining my mouth and speaking good things. And, and I went on the, the thought fast, Pastor John, and we did, we did 40 days where we fasted from wrong thinking all the way up right at the beginning of, of this whole COVID thing. And, and, and you know, Pastor, I, I got it down. I got it down. And uh, you may have done all those things, but how have you been behaving in the last few months? Uh, have you been applying what you've heard? See, sometimes we think we got it. In fact, sometimes we're like, can we please move on, Pastor John? I'm really not excited about this subject. Over the last few weeks, since the second major uh, crisis that's hit our nation, uh, that came as a result of the, of the murder of, of George Floyd, in Minneapolis. Now, some of you are going to, oh, geez, you're going to talk about it again. You'll be fine. It's okay. We can talk about it. But, but Pastor, when are you going to move on? What if people get offended? I have been offending people for over 30 years by doing my best to teach the truth. And somehow we've managed. I'm not intending to be defensive. But the truth is, you and I don't grow unless someone steps on our toe. A lot of times we hear it nice, but we don't get it. A lot of times when we're ready to move on because we're uncomfortable, that's the very, very moment we need to sit still and lean in because God is wanting us to learn something. And you're not going to learn something if all you hear are things you already know or make you feel comfortable. We only grow when we learn what we don't know. In fact, one of the laws of growth, whether it's the growth of your physical body, the growth of your mind, the growth of your skills is you have to do things repetitively that are uncomfortable. And when you first begin anything, whether it's a habit, it's working out, when you start doing it, you have to put energy and stress your muscles and you're sore and you want to quit. And any good trainer will tell you when you want to quit, you need to squeeze out a couple more. Because if we only exercise, if we only study, if we only connect with people to the level of our comfort, we're going to be so stinking shallow, we might as well move to Los Angeles County. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got a lot of friends in Los Angeles. Let's just say that the culture there is not known for depth. Uh, <laughs> okay. I got a lot of smart people in Los Angeles. So if you're watching, but most of you folks are from Orange County, the really, really sharp ones. Anyway, uh, if you're offended, I'm sorry, just a joke. Now listen, it's when we get uncomfortable that we start really learning things. And, you know, I didn't work out for like three months and gained my COVID-19. And uh, two weeks ago, you know, when, uh, finally I called my trainer and said, we've got to get back. And so I've been back two weeks and it feels so amazing, but it so hurts so much. Oh my gosh, you know, and you, you're looking at the weights you were doing and now I'm looking at the weights I'm doing now like half the weights I was doing when, when, you know, I stopped and I'm like, why didn't I just do some push-ups? Why didn't I, you know, but the reality is whatever, if you're going to get back to a place where you're fit and well, you're going to have to get uncomfortable, right? And if you're going to learn something, you've got to do more than just watch some YouTube videos. You've got to try it. You've got to actually do it. If you're going to develop your mind, you've got to do more than listen. It's good to listen to other people read, but, but if you really want to be an expert, you've got to learn to read. And that means sit still and get your mind quiet. See, to really gain mastery in any area of life, you've got to press through the discomfort. And the great sadness of the culture that I live in in America, and I'm aware that we're preaching to people all around the world, uh, and I also travel a lot and have been all over the world uh, in, in, in most, most continents and major nations, and I can say that, that 
you know, most of the, of the nations in the, in the rest of the world have both a love and a hate relationship with the United States, uh, loving the things that our country puts out that help advance things, but also uh, recognizing that our country puts out a lot of junk too. And, and one of the things that our country is uh, known for, and maybe we need to become self-aware of, is that uh, we are addicted to things that are comfortable. We, we are more comfortable speaking than we are listening. We are more comfortable, uh, especially now, uh, being seen than seeing. And uh, we don't like to do much of anything that requires much effort. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if we can drive through something rather than walk into a place, that's great. And if we can just push a button and get it delivered, that's wonderful. The next step is to have somebody you can get on an app that will actually take your groceries from the front door and put them away for you. Uh, but <laughs> the point is, we've m convenience, comfort is our ethos. We breathe this stuff. And the problem is that spiritual development doesn't happen by sitting on your couch and watching videos. It doesn't happen by going to the level of your tolerance and comfort. You've got to press beyond it. You've got to go further. And I just want to say to our friends and members, I'm talking now especially the members of Abundant Life that may be anxious because we've had some, some serious racial conversations in this nation and some, and some troubling times. And, and uh, you know, we've addressed some things. And, and having heard from a number of people, I, I, I've been an equal opportunity offender. There's some people that feel I have not talked about what happened to George Floyd enough. I haven't stood up enough for the black community. And there's folks in our church that feel like they don't even know if they want to come here anymore because they can't believe I'm not teaching the Bible. To all of you, I love you. But... I'm not here to make you comfortable. I'm not preaching politics, even though you may think that way. I'm teaching what the Lord has put in my spirit for this moment, and this is a new moment, and you're going to be uncomfortable. And, I'm doing, and what I'm trying to do is minister a word that is going to challenge us to go deeper than the surface. And I'm going to say something about our church, Abundant Life. Abundant Life, we are not a fragile congregation. We have been through a lot of stuff in 30 years, and we're going to walk through this and do well. And you're going to be fine. You just have to know, has God called you to be a part of this church? And do you believe that God's called you know, me to be your pastor and the pastoral team here to serve you? And if that's the case, just you, know, you don't have to like everything, but unless the Lord tells you something else, don't just walk away because you're hearing things that make you uncomfortable, because sometimes it's the discomfort that you need to hear that is going to cause you to grow to the next level. All right? Amen. I heard an amen from the five people that are in the sanctuary right now. That's good. All right. Breaking Babel. So I'm going to jump over here. I've only got a few minutes. I'm going to introduce this and just believe that God's going to give me uh, the right things to say in the few minutes we have left. In Genesis chapter 11, the Bible says, at one time, at one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and they used the same words. There was a time in this earth where everybody had the same language, and they all had the same lingo. They, had, they used the same words, the same vocabulary. I mean, we are a long way from that time. There are over 300 major languages, not including dialects, on the earth right now. And... Within languages, there are different uses of words. Now, if I, I'm here in the United States of America, if somebody, and I live in New York, so if somebody was to say to me, uh, oh, bless your darling heart, I would say, oh, how nice, thank you. I mean, that's kind of an unusual thing to say, but okay, bless my darling heart. But if I was in Mississippi, and I heard somebody say, bless their darling hearts, what it would mean in that culture is that person's an idiot, but I'm not going to say it. I'm just going to say, God bless them anyway. It's kind of a way to nicely communicate something that doesn't mean I really... <laughs> it's, <laughs> in other words, it has a different connotation. Now, you may be from the South and be really upset with me right now, but I think you pretty much know this. So it's a nice way to say they're, they're an idiot or you know, the, the, what they did was really stupid 
God bless their darling hearts, right? And sometimes it's kind of a code speech. So, and, and if you were in Boston and you were to say, uh, you know, somebody was to show you, you know, a new hair, haircut and they came out of the barbershop and they walked up and they said, what do you think? And the guy said, oh man, that's wicked, right? Well, in Boston and in places in the Northeast, and for those of us that come out of the 80s, wicked means awesome. That's so good, right? But if you're uh, maybe somewhere else in the United States where that word is not uh, used, wicked actually literally in the dictionary means evil, right? We're not saying it's evil. We're saying it's just really cool. Uh, so language has different connotations, even within a culture and within a language, right? And if we, could, if we talked about American English versus British English, it would be a whole different set of words. So, so there's so many different words and vocabularies and intentions, and people think differently when they hear the same words. But there was a time when everyone was in one place and spoke the same language, and use the same vocabulary. And it says, as the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babel, or Babylon, and they settled there. And they began saying, notice they're using their communication, saying to each other, let us make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used instead of mortar, which is interesting. I won't get into this. There's some who believe this is a, a rhetorical, which I, it's interesting, but let's just take it for what it says. So they're using bricks and they're using tar for mortar. Uh, what's the problem with tar for mortar? Just what do you think when it gets hot and 110 degrees and Babylon is basically in modern day Baghdad, Iraq, same, same 190 miles. What do you think happens on a hot day to tar? Yeah, not a really great way to build a tall building. But they said, we're going to do this. And then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. And this will make us famous. See, they wanted to be famous. They wanted to have 100,000 followers on Instagram. They wanted, they wanted everybody to know who they were. And so their idea was to be seen. Let us, it'll make us famous and keep us from being scattered. We don't want to be divided. Now, this is interesting. So the Lord comes down and looks at the city and the tower the people were building. They're in the process of getting the job done. And the Lord says, look, the people are united and they all speak the same language. So they're all, and then he says, after this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. This is God, the only one with whom nothing is really impossible. But God is saying about humans, these humans were not, they were, they were not following God. They were, in fact, when it says, let's build a tower, in the Hebrew, it can be read in defiance of the Lord. It was like the, they were the first humanists. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to do something for ourselves. And it was in defiance to their former relationship that they had with God. And so, and so God says, when humans, even humans that have wrong motives, when they're united and they understand each other and they have the same communication, Nothing can be withheld from them. What a statement. Nothing they imagine to do. If you can imagine it, you can do it. Even if you're not doing the right thing. Even if you're doing it in rebellion against God. Because God gave humans authority on the earth. He gave us a certain degree of power. And when humans get together in agreement, even non-unsaved humans, there's something powerful about unity on the earth when humans make the same, see the same image, think the same thing, and speak the same language and understand each other. And if you don't think that's true, take a look at every great world dictator that destroyed nations and cultures. You don't have to go any farther than Adolf Hitler and Hirohito, and you will see that they had one thing in Germany and in Japan. They had absolute unity. They had unity in a wicked plan, but nothing was able to stop them until other humans from different countries developed a same language, got together with the same goal, and then you had two groups of humans that were unified, and thank God those that were unified around, around God's purpose overcame and defeated the wicked. But I want you to know that when humans decide to do something, sometimes God has to interrupt 
what they're doing because they're advancing not just in culture, but they're advancing in wickedness. And so God said, we got to stop this now. Now, so what does God do? How does God stop the building? Now, God could, he's God, right? He could just drop a lightning bolt and blow up the tower. He could, uh, he could come down and, uh, and, and, you know, do some dramatic, miraculous thing where the whole city gets knocked down. But what do you think would have happened? They would have just gone right back and done it again. So God says the core issue of their advancement, human society's advancement without the knowledge of God, the core issue is that they're united and they understand each other. So God did something much more powerful than simply some miraculous destruction act. He went into their minds and changed their ability to understand each other. Let's take a look at what it says. This is remarkable. It says, come let us down and confuse the people, confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And in this way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused. The word Babel is short for Babylonian. It's the root of it, and it actually means confused. It's one of the translations, Semitically, confused or confusion. And so he said, the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. So how did God stop the progress of humanity and wickedness? He Actually, this is the first time that God poured out the gift of other tongues. Genesis 11 was the first time God supernaturally in one moment gave everyone different languages. But, the, but in Genesis 11, so just imagine you're all talking the same language and all of a sudden they start talking, but what's coming out of their mouth you don't understand. They're speaking what they think, but it's coming out in a language the other person doesn't understand. All these people are speaking in other tongues and they can't understand each other. So what happens? Well, the person that's speaking, let's just say for the sake of argument, Spanish, starts hearing someone else speaking Spanish and they can understand the other Spanish speaker. So they start getting together. And then, then the, 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 I can understand them and they come together. And so pretty soon, you've got people finding each other who can understand each other. And they start collecting together in groups and communities. What is God doing? He's dividing the power of this, hum, of this humanistic unity. He's breaking it down. Because really what they were looking for was a one world government. They wanted a one world government, a one world centered around humanity, a name for us the ultimate and the beginning of humanism, the beginning of atheism. Man can solve his own problems. We don't need God. We'll build ourselves a culture that will solve problems. And God said, not so fast, not without me. So you've got, now they start understanding each other, but in smaller groups. And what happens when people don't understand each other? Well, then they start fighting. Someone else is speaking Greek. All the Greek speakers find each other. All the Spanish speakers find each other. All the, the Aramaic speakers find each other. I mean, these languages weren't there in Genesis 11, right? These have developed because language changes. But the reality is they couldn't understand, so what did they do? They found people they could understand. They, they associated with people that they understood and they divided. And really, this is where what we call the races came from. But I just want to say something. Technically speaking, there's really only one race, the human race. And while we all have distinctive, perhaps cultural features, like tone of skin, shape of the eye, curl of hair, uh, we, we develop certain features based on where we've migrated. We know that people in northern climes tend to be lose... Uh, lose a pigmentation. Uh, genetically, we know that almost everybody was brown in skin in the original time, not, not light. You become lighter as you move north, the body adapts. And so we develop these particular features, but really it was language and culture that divided people. And they began to just 
pursue their own cultural goals. Now, why would God do this? He was slowing the, the power of humanity in its fallen condition to progress without God. And the very next thing that God does, Genesis chapter 12, the very next chapter, God finds a man who's with a group called the Chaldeans. These are people that are now speaking Chaldean. This could be a thousand, two thousand years later, but, but there, there's a man, and God says, now I'm going to raise him up, and his name is Abraham. And God raises him, and from him raises a family, and from that family raises a race, a culture called the Jewish people. And he uses that family to bring his Messiah, who will then open the door for God to bring blessing to all the, quote, we say races, the scriptural term is nations or cultures of the earth, all the ethnicities of the earth, right? And so Babel was what God used to divide it. Now, we studied that on the day of Pentecost, the church is born, and when the church is born, there's people from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the second time God pours out the gift of other tongues, and everyone starts speaking in tongues, and here's the thing, they're all speaking different languages, but this time it doesn't divide, it unites. And why? Because the Bible says they were all speaking in their own tongue the wonderful works of God. In other words, they were saying the same thing in many languages. And so Pentecost, which is the birth of the church, is a symbol that the church is designed to break Babel. What God did in Babel to divide the races because of their defiance of God and to slow the growth of wickedness, God undid on Pentecost by giving birth to the church. So the church was born with every nation, 3,000 people, the Bible says on the first day, from every race or nation, ethnicity under heaven, all speak, even though they had different languages, when they spoke in tongues, when they all were in the Holy Spirit, they could flow together. The gift of other tongues that comes at Pentecost is the ability for Christians in Jesus only, even though we still may not understand, we can tell the same spirit. Here's the thing. I can go anywhere in the world. I've been to Africa, to India, and to places in remote China, in Siberia, in Russia, in the Ukraine. I've been in South Central America. Everywhere I've been, where I've been with believers. Even though in most of these places, I did not know their language, Greece, Turkey, when I came across a believer, I knew they were a believer, even if I couldn't understand their language. Do you know why? Because they carry the same spirit. Those of us who are born again are born of the same spirit, and my spirit will bear witness to your spirit that we are a child of God. Now, we may not think the same about a ton of things. We may not think the same about, about voting, uh, who we vote for. We may not think the same about what food is good or bad. We may not come from the same family culture because we have different ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds. And, in this, and today, color is a big deal. And it has been, although in the ancient world, color was not the same. It didn't, people didn't divide up according to color as much according, as according to culture because of what's happened in the last four or five hundred years and the oppression of people of color, what we call people of color, black and brown people, there is a huge distinction. Uh, and, and, uh, and all of that is very real in the human relationship. But at, at Pentecost, those divisions were now set aside because there's one new humanity. There's one new, the same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you and lives in the person next to you and every person that accepts Christ, we're all one in Christ. Jesus isn't the white savior, he's not the black savior, he's not the brown, he's the savior of everyone. All nations, all people are in Jesus Christ. How we depict him according to the flesh is not important. It's because it's who we are in the spirit that counts. So, since we're all born again and we all have the Holy Spirit in us and the love of God in us, that should solve it, right? We should just be able to just get along and just love. But if you study the New Testament, you will see that even though they were saved and even though their hearts were connected to God, they had problems. 
And you know what kinds of problems they had in the first church? Cultural problems. Between historically Jewish people and Gentile people. Between Cretes, people from Crete, and people from Greece. They had issues. And they came to the church with those issues. And though they're saved, they had many issues. In fact, that's why most of the letters... 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Timothy, both Timothys, Titus, Philemon, James, 1 John. They all have language that entreats Christians, they're written to believers, to love each other, to stop fighting, to stop uh, to stop bringing their baggage from their old life and their old way of thinking into the new community. We wouldn't have the New Testament letters. We would have hardly anything after the Gospels if it wasn't for the problems of born-again Christians communicating to each other. And so over and over again, so what is Paul? He writes, now listen, if you're an employer, this is how you treat somebody else. If you're a husband, this is how you treat your wife. If you're a wife, this is how you treat your husband. This is how dads need to treat their kids. Kids, this is how you should relate to your father. This is how you should relate to your pastors. This is how you need to honor authority. This is how you relate to the government. Stop fighting. Stop being bitter. Don't let a root of bitterness spring up, defiling many. Don't argue with, with, with worthless arguments and wranglings like the world over and over and over and over over and over again. And what does God say we need to do? We need to lean in. And yes, I can be saved, you can be saved, and we can all come and worship together. But now we need to lean in and start loving. And that means start listening to each other and learning to understand each other so we can work together. We have the basis of fellowship in Jesus. Now we've got to learn to listen to each other's hurts and pains so that one part of the body is suffering The other part of the body doesn't say, well, get over it. Take responsibility. Grow up. I don't see it, so it must not be real. If if I never seen it, it couldn't be true. Develop a little humility and realize that people need you to believe their stories. Even if their stories isn't, I have, have factual errors in them. Sometimes if it's that person's perspective, it's true for them. The only way a person can come to see what might be wrong in their own thinking and perception is when people who love them listen to them and affirm them. And that means everyone needs to lean in and listen to each other because we have to break Babel in the church. We've got to break Babel in the church. I'm going to end with this verse, and we're going to pick up here next week. James chapter 1 and verse 19. This is what Pastor James says. He's writing a letter to the churches and to the believers scattered throughout, throughout really the Roman Empire, throughout the world. And he says this in James 1 and verse 19. Understand this. Understand this. My dear brothers and sisters... He calls them, so they're family. We're talking family here. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak. We might say today, slow to post, and slow to get angry. Why? Verse 20. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And I just want to give you something. The word righteousness is the Greek word dekaiosune, which is translated righteousness theologically, but it's also the word for justice. So let's just insert that word. For human anger does not produce the justice God desires. Now, we need to cry out for justice in our culture and in our world, and we need to call things that are evil, evil. But there's a way that Christians are called to work for righteousness in culture, society, and in, and, or justice, and that is not through human anger. It's understandable, but it's not going to produce the results the way that God wants them produced. 
So what am I going to do? I feel angry. I'm upset. I'm upset at my brothers and sisters who are insensitive to my perspective and the way that I think. I'm upset that my pastor is constantly talking about this. I thought he voted like me. You don't even know what I, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. You don't even know what I vote. I want somebody to affirm what my favorite nightly commentator on my favorite news channel tells me to think every single time I watch it at night. My pastor doesn't seem to agree with that. Probably not on everything, no. See, you want me to affirm your bias that is not really informed by Scripture as much as it is by money-driven media. And that's not my job. There is a wound in this nation. There is a wound in this nation. There's a wound in this world. Black and brown people are hurting and have been hurting for many years. And white people who don't see it or maybe don't feel prejudice personally saying it's not there doesn't validate the realities of our brothers and sisters who say, this is my experience. And by the way, I can validate somebody's experience without attacking the men and women who serve in uniform. Saying that all police are racists is like saying all husbands are wife beaters because some are really bad there's some bad husbands and some bad dads but today we celebrate fathers just because there's a lot of bad ones doesn't mean there aren't any good ones in fact there's a lot of good dads and a lot of a lot and the truth is there's a lot of fathers and a lot of husbands who are doing the best they know how and they're not perfect and they make some mistakes Just because you've had bad experiences with the women that were hurtful to you doesn't mean all women are blank, blank, blank. And just because there have been and there is some systemic issues in the way that we've enforced law in this nation doesn't mean you need to see a law enforcement officer and look at them with disdain or curse them or spit upon them or be seen with somebody carrying a sign that says blank the police. Because we're called to live a life of honor. And you know I'm right. You, it's not even that I'm right. You know this is God's word right now. So stop trying to let culture force you into a binary way of thinking. And even if somebody says something that is offensive and culturally hurtful, your job is not to get angry with them and then write about them or to yell at them with posts. But really, the Bible says, you who are spiritual, if you see someone overtaken in a fault, you are to restore them in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also are tempted. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Bear one another's burdens. The burden of someone's falling or failure or blindness, you're supposed to bear their burden with them and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hey, if you want to be an angry uh, secular activist, that's fine. But if you want to be a Christian, there are certain things that may be right as an American, that are wrong as a Christian. I'm just gonna tell you, you gotta grow up. Because before you're an American, you're a Jesus person, you're a Christian. Before you're white, you're a Christian. Before you're black, you're a Christian. You'll say, no, no, I was black before I got saved. Before you were born, God called you to be in his family. So before you were black, you were, you were in the family of God, called and known by him. Can we stop, please, in the church, yelling at each other and just listen? Can we do what James is saying? Can we be slow to speak, quick to listen, and, and just take the anger down a notch when everybody else is flipping out and yelling all the time? Can we just turn some of that junk off and just let peace reign? And realize, yes, in the church, if you've got a church that's 80% white or 90% black or 90% or Hispanic, you might have some issues, but when you're in a church that looks like the America 
a church of all nations, like we're blessed to live in in this church, just because you come and sing together doesn't mean you've grown sufficiently. You need to sit and lean into each other. And you're going to have to take a little bit of other people's hurt and offense, and you're going to have to listen to it, and you're going to have to love each other. You're going to have to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to wrath. And some of you just get stinking off your, your, your Facebook right now. Just get off it. Stop. You can't handle it. Start loving. Stop trying to find confirmation bias for what you already think that is dividing you from other Christians. This is Father's Day. Pastor, I don't want to hear this. I don't care. You know it's what you need to hear right now. And whether it's the cultural racial thing or it's husband and wife thing or it's moms and dads things, we need to stop yelling and start loving. We need to just calm down and listen to each other. I'm not saying you you can't feel angry, but you need to bring it down and lean in and listen. Because it's that spirit that will work the justice and the righteousness that God desires. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, I am going to let you go. I want to pray for you right now. If you're watching, uh, wherever you're watching, whether uh, whatever service uh, you may be in, the Holy Spirit is with you right now, and He's with us, and He wants us to surrender the things that have divided us and to learn to speak the language of the Spirit, which is love. That's why we were filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we can really center on something greater than the things that have divided up this world. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, there are so many things in this world by which we can divide and then unite with people who think like us or look like us or have the same economic experience as us or have suffered the same pain as us. And Father, there's nothing wrong with associating with people we can relate to, but in Christ we're called to do more than that. We're called to break Babel. And in the church, we are called to let the Holy Spirit help us to listen to the languages of others and learn that language. We couldn't possibly do it if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. So Spirit of God, I pray that you'd help husbands and wives, and I just see this right now, husbands and wives that are watching, even boyfriends and girlfriends, couples, and you have been fighting, you have been, you are like at the end of it, because you're exhausted, you're tired, you're weary. And I just want to say peace in the name of Jesus. Peace in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would break the spirit of, of, of Lord, of frustration and confusion and anger that exists in couples and in families right now in Jesus name and moms and dads that have kids that are driving them crazy and kids that are ready to go to the courts and get liberated from their parents because they were all cooped up and we're driving each other nuts father I come against that spirit of division in families and I pray that today you would do what you said through the prophet Micah you would or Malachi you would turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the hearts of the children towards the fathers Father, I pray that for those of us that love you, as we return to you, just like the prodigal son, when he came back to father's house, he was united with father, but his brother had big problems with him. His older brother was all over him, jealous, angry, mad, mad at, mad at his dad, mad at his brother. And Lord, there's, in this family we call the church, there's some people really mad at each other. And Lord, we're not fragile. We can handle that. You can handle that. Now, Lord, help us to learn to listen to each other and to love each other. Help us to learn to be together in Father's house because there's enough fatted calves for everybody. There's enough drink for everybody. There's enough wine for all of us. There is enough money for all of us. There is enough blessing and peace for all of us. And Lord, let us prefer one another and not just look out for our own interests. Help us, Father, in this church and in the churches of all those that are watching and listening, thousands all over the world, I pray that you would give them 
the same spirit right now, the spirit of Pentecost. And then we would realize the thing that unites us in Jesus is greater than, than the things that would tend to divide us. Hallelujah. I speak peace and I take authority over the spirit of babble and confusion and misunderstanding. I break its power in the lives of every person, in the home of every person that's listening to me right now by the authority God has given me as a pastor and a prophet. I speak and I break the spirit of babble over your home, your family, and confusion. Leave the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. And I thank you. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The spirit of peace in us is greater than the spirit of hostility that's in the world. We receive that spirit right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never given your life to Jesus right now, if you're watching on a device, you can just chat in the chat box and just say, I'm coming home. I'm coming, I'm coming back to God. I'm giving my life to the Lord. I'm coming back to my Father God. Just say that right now. And when you do, someone, one of our hosts are going to see your, your post and we're going to send you something. There's also on some of our, uh, some of our uh, devices, uh, there's uh, a little button that says raise your hand. If you click raise your hand, you're saying, I'm coming home to God. I'm going to stop all of this, this nastiness and I'm going to start walking in the spirit. I'm going to come back and let God give me the spirit of understanding so we can we can heal some stuff. And if you click that, we're going to send you a link. And that link's going to have just a simple information. We're going to ask you to fill that out so we can get you something that will be a blessing to your life. So if you click the link and then go ahead and follow up and fill that out, let us know that you made a decision for the Lord today. Let us know what God has done in your life. We want to bless you and we want to walk with you. Continue to meet in homes and Lord willing, we'll see you Wednesday right here. Have a phenomenal Father's Day. In Jesus' name, may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. And may something great happen in your life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. You can connect with us throughout the week by downloading our app, listening to our podcast, or visiting our YouTube channel. And whether you're new to Abundant Life or you've been coming for a while and want to learn more about the ministry, just text the word NEXT to 315-888-5332. We'll get you connected to all the ways that you can grow deeper in your faith and discover what's next for you. And if God has impacted your life through this ministry, we invite you to partner with us financially to help us continue to reach people throughout the world and in our community. Head on over to alcclife.org give or use the giving tab on our app to choose the best giving option for you. Thanks again for joining us today. We pray that you continue to experience a more abundant